of all, thank you everyone and welcome to the 39th Canadian Sustainability Indicator Network uh, lev uh, live webinar. Uh, my name is Krista Roost and I'm coordinator and uh, also a project manager with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, I would like to note that we are undergoing a little bit of change over here and my last day uh, with ISD and CSUN is actually tomorrow. Uh, Carlos Zubricki, who's also joining me, uh, will be taking over the network uh, as I'm moving on to a new and exciting career opportunity. Uh, so she's learning the ropes here today and it's good we've had some technical difficulties because she's learning that much more as a result. Uh, so she will be taking on uh, the network and devoting her time to producing the next webinar which will hopefully be coming up uh, towards the end of March as well. Uh, please note that today's presentation is being recorded uh, and will be made available to the CSUN members along with any related presentation materials. Just wanted a couple housekeeping notes for everyone. Uh, we do have a Twitter feed on the CSUN website. If you're on Twitter, be sure to follow CSUN2010 uh, for the latest news and information in the realm of sustainability metrics and all things similar. Uh, we've opened up access to our learning events uh, for both February and March to help attract new members. So if you're on this webinar right now and you're not already a member, consider joining this uh, dynamic and growing community of practice. You can do so by going to the CSUN website, www.csun-rcid.ca, or emailing csin at iisd.ca to get information on both benefits and registration. Um, as I mentioned, planning is underway for the next uh, learning event webinar. Uh, an announcement from Carla will be forthcoming. So if you're a CSUN member, be sure to watch your inbox. If you're not yet a CSUN member, I'm sure if you watch Twitter, you'll find out information about the event. Um, now for our feature presentation. Uh, we are very excited to uh, welcome a diverse crowd of participants uh, here today. Uh, and our gracious presenter, uh, Alex, who is presenting us uh, uh, on the topic of target setting and environmental indicators. Uh, so this will be a brief presentation which will describe different approaches applied uh, by the Environmental Performance Index and earlier efforts such as the Wellbeing Index uh, to setting targets. Uh, today's learning event is scheduled to run from 12 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, the presentation will take about 25 or 30 minutes and then we're going to open things up to questions and discussion. So make sure you got your pen and paper handy because we would really love to have some discussion uh, we've got your presenter here uh, to provide feedback, and it would be wonderful if we could have a lively discussion. Uh, so um, perhaps what we'll do is we'll switch things over to Alex. And Alex, if you want to briefly introduce yourself uh, to the group uh, and your area of expertise, and then uh, you should be able to uh, take over my mouse and advance slides. If there's any trouble with that, we can do that on our end here for you as well. But uh, go ahead, Alex. Thanks, thanks a lot, Krista. I'm going to switch over here. Um, can you hear me still? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I had headsets on and I was hearing myself talk, which is enough to drive you crazy. So um, let me shut down one of these and I'll use the uh, voice over internet to this webinar. I think if you want to hit control L, maybe you should just drive and I'll say next, okay, now that I'm on. Okay, um, And it'll be easier for me. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, I'm a geographer. I've been with um, what we call CSEN, which is a Center for International Earth Science Information Network at the Earth Institute. It's part of Columbia University. Really since CSEN joined the Earth Institute, which was in 1990 eight or thereabouts. I, I joined a year later. Um, <clears throat> season was an independent NGO based in um, Saginaw, Michigan. And uh, we uh, joined Columbia and the Earth Institute really when the Earth Institute was just getting off the ground here. Um, since about, well really since I joined season, uh, probably in the first month or so, uh, we met with colleagues at Yale University uh, who were seeking to develop a, um, uh, well, it was essentially a, um, a collaboration that began between Mark Levy, who's the deputy director at CSEN, and, and Dan Esty, who heads the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy. And the two of them, in 1999, decided that it would be a good idea to put the two um, uh, groups together to develop 
uh, sustainability index, and we called it the Environmental Sustainability Index. So I'll describe a little bit more of the background on the ESI and then our current effort, which is the EPI, in a moment. But that gives you a little bit of uh, the background and why there's two logos at the bottom right-hand corner of this title slide. So if you would progress to the next slide, Krista. Um, <clears throat> now, I, don't, uh, I didn't want to you know, do too much Indicator 101, but I thought it, for reference purposes it might be worth uh, putting up uh, a quote from the EPA. I'm sure the Canadian uh, Environment Agency has a similar uh, quote on environmental indicators. And uh, you can see the sort of standard elements of the pressure state um, response or some people prefer the extended OECD framework, which is driving force, pressure, state, impact response. Um, in any case, we, uh, you know, most environmental indicators trace their roots back to something along these lines. And really what we're talking about today is um, approaches to normal, normalization of data, uh, because if you're going to produce indicators, especially if you want to produce any kind of index, <coughs> which aggregates multiple uh, indicators, uh, you have to normalize the data in some meaningful way. So I'll get into that a little bit more in, in a moment. Um, I guess if you want to just go to the next slide. <coughs> Sorry, I'm literally just getting off the plane yesterday from Europe and I <coughs> haven't quite recovered from a cold. So if you hear me um, coughing here and there, that's the reason why. Um, so I'm going to be providing examples of <coughs> five different um, uh, indicator uh, efforts that um, make use of targets. So if you go to the next slide. And before I go too much further, I will just mention that this is, you know, meant, in my view, this is, will be as much of a learning experience as it is that I'm, you know, providing some uh, as a presenter pro providing some input. Uh, I think that no one's really figured out how to do this target setting uh, in, in, um, in, you know, in the most appropriate ways. And so we all really need to learn from one another. And, and so that's the spirit in which I'm presenting this. So, um, you know, recently we went through an exercise uh, after having been in this business for about 12 or 13 years to uh, look at uh, essentially what how indicators are being used in practice to inform and shape policy and uh, there's been some useful research that's been done in uh, the European Union to a project called point point is uh, the policy influence of indicators project and um, a lot of their material is is uh, available only through um, kind of uh, working papers and reports. I think they've published a few things in peer-reviewed journals, but if people are interested in looking at this in more detail, uh, I can send some of those PDFs along. But they basically pointed out three kind of uh, uses of indicators and policy processes. One is uh, instrumental use in which uh, indicators are used very directly, you know, um, to manage a particular problem. So uh, if your particulate matter goes up above a certain level, uh, you, you know, immediately put in place policies, for instance, to uh, enforce alternative day driving based on your license plate number. So that would be an example of an instrumental use. And they found that there were actually very few cases in the, in the case studies that they reviewed largely in Europe that actually uh, made such instrumental use of indicators. They did find that indicators provide a much uh, broader sort of conceptual basis for understanding problems and for addressing problems. And I think one thing that's important for those of us who are working in this landscape is to realize that you know, our, our conceptual frameworks and our, our framing of the issues is not entirely neutral. I think we all bring certain preconceived notions with us. Uh, so um, we need to be aware of those and um, understand how our conceptions may uh, not always be shared by others. We found in our work that in some cases, Asian countries come to us and say, well, you're coming at this from a Western, basically US-based um, lens, and we have different, different ideas of how uh, environmental uh, issues should be prioritized. So that's been an interesting dialogue. 
Uh, the third use is basically political, um, and you know they uh, indicators can be used to to legitimize or delegitimize policies or policy actors. We've all you know seen the iconic image of a congressman or a senator holding up a report and saying this report tells us that blah blah blah, and therefore our um, you know we need to uh, go in this direction or that direction. They can also be used to penalize people, and so uh, examples might be in China. There's use of targets that are um, if you exceed your target over a certain period as a governor of a state of a province. Um, you could potentially suffer political repercussions. Of course, um, whether or not you suffer those repercussions probably depends largely on whether you're in or out of favor with the powers that be. But nevertheless, um, those targets, uh, if they're exceeded, could be used as a way of legitimizing your, um, your downfall or your removal. Uh, so these are some of the uses of indicators. And, and in each case, you can see, uh, imagine ways in which targets may play a role. Uh, in, in understanding, um, you know, in, in either instrumental use, if you exceed a threshold, making some policy change conceptually, uh, just the very use of targets may be um, viewed by some as, in fact, a <coughs> kind of a Western um, management consulting kind of uh, worldview that enforces people's, um, you know, the expectation that people should meet certain, uh, certain um, productivity targets or, or goals. Um, and then, of course, below we had, you know, we've learned from the broad literature on indicators and policy processes is that to be effective, indicators need to be credible, so they, they need to be valid and reliable and based uh, on scientifically sound measurements. Uh, they need to be legitimate and represent the views of stakeholders. They need to be salient and um, viewed of high importance to policy makers. It's you, know, you can have the best indicator in the world, but if policymakers don't view it as uh, particularly uh, important at that time, uh, it's going to fall largely on deaf ears. Uh, and they need to be comprehensible, in other words, easy to explain. And um, this goes as much for, for targets as any other area. I mean, we um, it, it, obviously for global um, indicators like the ones that we produce, we can't consult with everybody in the world to find out what they think is a reasonable target. But if you're doing a community-based effort, I think it would behoove you to look at um, what community members view as uh, desirable uh, levels of a certain environmental parameter. Let's go to the next slide. And we have a few examples of, of ways in which our indicators have been used um, in um, policy uh, arenas to affect change. And some of these we just found out about uh, coincidentally. Um, for instance, in 2001, uh, we published an environmental sustainability index uh, which found that Korea was lagging well behind its neighbors on air quality. Uh, and Korea, uh, unbeknownst to us, organized a national level policy debate with the prime minister or president and, and major Korean Hollywood stars and uh, their equivalent of Hollywood anyway, and, and musicians and others who got together and basically discussed what needed to be done. And they actually, out of that discussion, uh, because there were so many high-level actors involved, they put in place some very stringent pollution control and abatement measures. Uh, air is still not perfect in Seoul, but it's a lot better than it was at the time that we, uh, we released that report. Um, and that has actually subsequently resulted in, in further collaboration with Korean partners on a number of areas of uh, mutual interest. The next um, you know, uh, bullet is basically uh, the EPI itself and, and essentially our work back uh, between the ESI and the EPI uh, has garnered policy attention because it's released in high-level forum like Davos where prime ministers and others uh, gather and if they do poorly on a particular index that's being handed out in the corridors, uh, it may cause them to um, you know, actually pay some attention and, uh, because they feel they need to live up to, to certain standards. Um, in the U.S., we have had a good experience with the air quality index, and I'll touch on that a, a little bit later. Uh, one of the point projects that they felt was particularly a uh, useful example was a Danish action plan for the aquatic environment. And basically, by using quantitative data, the Danish government um, 
was able to find areas where um, you know particular water quality issues were less, um, especially in the coastal zone, but also in their river and, and, and lakes, uh, where the water quality was better. And so they started asking, well, why is that the case? What were they doing that's different? And it led to um, discovery of some uh, approaches and measures that were being taken in those areas that that uh, were more widely replicated. Um, we also involved with an effort to develop um, indicators for the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is a U.S. government aid uh, 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 mechanism that supplements what we do through the U.S. Agency for International Development. And they've been very quantitative and very target driven. And so uh, <clears throat> among the uh, indicators that they have uh, in their in their overall framework are indicators such as a number of days it requires to set up a business, um, a number of measures of you know literacy and basic human uh, well-being, and then we were asked to produce some indicators related to uh, environmental health and also uh, protected areas coverage. And as a result of the you know basically um, repurposing some of our indicators from the EPI for that measure, what happened was it became a tremendous spur for a number of countries that were borderline in terms of the criteria that they needed to receive funding from the Millennium Challenge Corporation. It, it provided a spur for them to actually um, implement policies. So this is the sort of, you know, what we're hope, hoping for in many of our uh, efforts is to actually spur policy change. And then, of course, the ecological footprint has been very good at garnering media attention, and they have um, set certain thresholds in terms of, uh, you know, hectares of arable land per person, uh, biologically productive hectares of arable land, and and that's gained quite a bit of attention. So let's move on to the next slide, and uh, I should have put this up earlier. I apologize for that, but I was rushing a bit to get these slides together. But this gives you a little bit of the history. Just briefly, the ESI uh, was our earliest effort. And the reason, well, we phased it out. And, and the way we measured the, the we compared countries in the ESI was a relative measure. So we used what are called z-scores, um, which I believe is the standard devi deviation minus the mean divided by the mean. And that gives you a, a range of, of values from negative 2 um, standard deviations below to positive two. In some cases, you have outliers that go even further uh, beyond two standard deviations. And uh, what it was is basically saying, okay, we're just going to stack up all the countries in the world and see how they do relatively uh, against one another. Um, what we found was that, that it resonated with certain communities, and it has been picked up and used. And in fact, we're thinking about doing a uh, kind of a uh, decadal update in 2015 um, because we have sense that there was uh, there was a purpose to the ESI oops um, my screen just disappeared but it's back uh, there was a purpose to the ESI that, that is not being fully met by the EPI but our, our rationale for moving from the ESI to the EPI was essentially a belief that um, uh, decision makers in at the highest levels, uh, would be more uh, stimulated to to um, you know in, introduce policy changes if they um, uh, were able to understand how far they were from certain certain internationally um, agreed upon targets. Uh, as you'll see in a moment, uh, not all of our indicators are based on uh, agreed targets, but we try to as much as possible uh, use. Um, targets that are, are, you know, generally recognized as, as at least, if not feasible, then ideal at some level, and uh, that all countries can can strive towards. Uh, it has, I think, as a result, um, gained a certain amount of uh, policy attention. Uh, we are the last to say that it's a, a perfect instrument. We think there's a lot of room for improvement, but we have been making incremental changes, and I'll get to those in a moment. If you could go to the next slide, Krista. So the way the EPI is constructed is basically to set a top performance benchmark at the right-hand side, and that's your essentially your target. That's what you're aiming for. And 
on the left hand side you'll see the low performance benchmark and that's essentially the equivalent of zero in the uh, in a score of zero to 100 so at the top performance you would have a score of 100 at the uh, low performance benchmark the country would have a score of zero you have the international range and then any given country falls somewhere in that range and uh, we call the score that they receive not a distance to target score but a proximity to target score so there's a typo on this slide but we basically measure a country score uh, let's say you're you're 80 and so that would be roughly 80 percent of the way to the um, to the international target next slide uh, the targets that we use in the EPI and our uh, in really all iterations of the EPI were derive from essentially the following range of, um, uh, of criteria. The, the gold standard is if there's a treaty or other internationally agreed upon goal for, a, for an indicator. The next would be standards or recommendations set by international organizations. Um, the next would be leading national regulatory requirements. So if the US EPA or Canada's Environment Agency um, Environment Canada sets a particular target for a um, pollutant of some sort, then that would be the um, essentially the target um, for that pollutant or it, it would have to be sort of a widely recognized um, leading country in that area. The, the fourth is basically expert judgment and prevailing scientific consensus and I'm afraid that we I'll fall back on that far more than we'd like to, um, but that is such is the nature of indicators, and we can get into that a little bit more later. Uh, and then, essentially, uh, another factor that we weigh in terms of our target setting is the range of values that have been observed historically for a given parameter. Um, so, in the 2012 EPI, we actually went from solely reporting the most recent year to including a time series for each of the indicators. And in order to set the low performance benchmark for, for the indicators, we actually had to go back in time to find the lowest performing country. Um, let me just add one thing in terms of low performance benchmark. Um, if, you know, if you understand the math, you'll understand that the low performance ben benchmark is far from trivial, you need to set a reasonable low performance benchmark in order to get your international range. And if you set it one way or the other, it will obviously affect the scores of countries that are in between. Um, so what we will often do is look at the statistical distribution of a variable, and there's often a very long tail of um, a few laggards that are really, really behind all the other countries and are doing really poorly on a given indicator. And so in those cases, what we'll do is we'll uh, Winserize um, or truncate or trim the tail is the word, uh, depending on what term you prefer, and and set it at say the 95th percentile value for that particular um, parameter. And um, maybe we'll have some examples I can get into later. But why don't we go to the next slide? Uh, so this is you know how the EPI is constructed. Um, it's sorry for the small print. Um, it's very hard to read, but we have essentially two objectives. One is environmental health and the other is ecosystem vitality. Um, you know, in the early days we weren't, we did not organize things in this way, um, especially with the ESI. We had multiple components, uh, something like five or six components and something like 67 or 70 or more indicators. Um, but with this EPI, we sought to reduce the number of indicators. So I think there's something like 20 or 22 indicators in the EPI. Uh, that's varied over time. So we've you know, increased or decreased depending on whether new, new data became available. Um, basically, we feel that uh, if, if you were solely to measure the environmental uh, or ecosystem portion, that many decision makers would not be terribly interested. So we felt it important to um, include the environmental health component as a separate component, which is essentially how well humans are doing uh, as a reflection of their environmental conditions. Uh, you'll see that the weight is roughly 30% for environmental health and 70% for ecosystem vitality. 
Um, that's partly um, due to the fact that uh, the environmental health data has a much lower spread. Um, and so, or, yeah, I think it has a lower spread. So in other words, statistically, there were some factors that we needed to um, address in order to get a proper balance between ecosystem vitality and eco environmental health. The other factor is basically if you overweight environmental health, your, your indicator basically becomes a development indicator. It's measuring how well developed countries are. And so we wanted to try to avoid that if possible. Um, and then you can see to the right of the cat objectives are policy categories, uh, environmental health, air, water on the top, and then uh, air, ecosystem effects, water, resources, ecosystem effects. Again, these are, we tried to separate out where air and water affects human health versus where air and water are affecting ecosystem processes. Um, and then biodiversity and habitat, agriculture, uh, forests, um, fisheries, and climate change and energy. Um, I'll get into the indicators in the a, in a, in a next slide. Uh, so this gives you a sample uh, Malaysia country profile. And um, this is the way that we report the results. And basically, again, zero is, is farthest from the target and 100 is closest to the target. And we found that this is a very effective way of, of presenting the results. Um, countries can immediately grasp if they're close or not to the target. Admittedly, um, you know, there are some, um, there's a lot of statistical underpinnings in this. And so, uh, you know, it's, this is hardly, um, let's say, you know, it's, it's hard to say that, well, if you just put in 50% more effort, your ecosystem vitality would go up by, a, uh, you know, to 100 and, and you'd be fine. There, there are a lot of, a lot of um, um, difficulties in translating this from, you know, from this sort of indicator realm to uh, uh, quantitative levels of effort or what you would need to do to get there. Um, but it does, I think, in general, for each of the indicators, make it and, and components we try to make it as clear as possible where a country is, is lagging and where a country is doing well so that they can better target their, their efforts. Uh, the, the, the bars on the right-hand side are, are sort of pilot trend results, and they're essentially the colors represent whether a country is improving. So green means it's getting better. Brown means it's generally falling, uh, it's getting worse over time. Um, and so that, that's meant to sort of indicate to countries whether they're, uh, they may be doing well on an indicator, but they may be falling behind, and so they may need to continue to, to um, stress that policy area, or they may be uh, doing poorly and getting better, in which case they need to just continue to, to improve. Uh, next slide, please. So this is kind of the, the, the core of the presentation in which uh, I'm just going to go through a number of the indicators and describe uh, a bit of our rationale and, and justification for the indicators that we, uh, for the targets that we set and um, some, some information on the sources. So for child mortality, basically there's a, uh, this is the probability of dying um, between age, I think, one and five. Uh, we exclude uh, infants because between zero and one, um, a lot of the deaths occur because of health complications and not environmental factors. But we felt that children are kind of a bellwether of whether or not your environment's doing well. And we set the target at the fifth percentile of the global distribution, and that's, that's the probability there, 0 0.0007. Um, pretty low. But we didn't feel it would be justified to, to set it at zero because, of course, there will always be some level of child mortality. Um, Particulate matter has a WHO uh, international standard of 10 micrograms per meter cube for um, PM 2.5. I'm going to get a little bit more into air quality indicators in a bit, so I won't dwell on that. Um, so that one was a fairly clear-cut case. Um, what you'll see uh, is that, in general, on the top half here, we have um, uh, a number of indicators that come from, like the Millennium Development Goals or elsewhere, that are fairly well established in international opinion. Some of the other ones, like indoor air pollution, I think it's fairly straightforward to say, well, um, what we really want is 0 percent. Uh, this is a, a metric of burning, um, burning 
wood or firewood inside uh, a closed environment. So what we'd like to have is 0% of people exposed to that kind of level of uh, particulate matter in, in their homes. Um, if you go below uh, access to sanitation, um, SO2, SO2, uh, all of these are expert opinion. We basically think that you, know, you should try to get as close to zero as possible, but it's really an ideal. Change in water quantity is essentially a measure of how much um, abstraction of water occurs in, on average within the watersheds of a country. And uh, you know, we again think that ideally you'd have a, a score of zero. We realize very few countries come anywhere close to that. Maybe Guyana and a few others uh, are on the you know, higher end of the scale in terms of closer to the target. Um, biome protection is, was set by the Convention on Biological Diversity as well as marine protection. So these are the percent of the territory that are, are protected under protected areas. Critical habitat protection, there's no international agreement, but these are um, sites listed by the Alliance for Zero Extinction, and we believe that essentially they should be 100% covered. Um, next slide. The, the next set is basically a, a bunch of forest-related um, indicators. What you'll notice is um, our statistician logged the variables and then basically, based on the distribution, came up with uh, what he felt were reasonable targets sort of for the top 5% of performers and the, the bottom 95th percentile of performers. He basically cut the um, log scales at those levels and, and uh, um, countries were measured on the 0 to 100 scale between those two, um, two points. Uh, coastal shell fishing, again, was done based on statistical distribution. That's actually pr produced by your very own Sea Around Us product, project at the University of British Columbia. And another fisheries one was expert opinion. Agricultural subsidies, we believe, should be at zero, expert opinion. Pesticide regulation is based on the Stockholm Convention, and we give countries a certain number of points based on the pesticides, that, the, the dirty dozen of pesticides that they should be outlawing or at least restricting. And so we give them a certain number of points, and 22 is the target. That's a maximum number of um, banned chemicals. Um, CO2 emissions per capita, this was a case where the IPCC said that we need to have emissions from our 2000 levels. So we basically um, uh, projected population for each country, looked at their 20, 2000 emissions per capita, and said by 2050, uh, based on their popula projected population, they should have um, a certain level of emissions. And um, uh, the I'm not sure about this one. I actually have to dig into the dig into the um, documentation a little bit further, but uh, I'm not sure if this is a universal target or uh, maybe this is the global world population target, um, and then every country should meet meet that level. That's probably more likely the case. And then uh, emissions for GDP was done in a similar way, uh, looking at uh, having of emissions by 2050. Um, the CO2 emissions uh, per electrical generation was, again, expert opinion, and renewable electricity should be at 100%, again, based on expert opinion. So I'm sure there will be lots of comments and critiques on that, but let's, let's move on to the next slide. Um, and then this you can't read. I just wanted to show that we, uh, in the past, for instance, 2010, we had um, you know, a different set of indicators, slightly different environmental burden of disease was, was um, uh, an effort that was not sustained. Um, so we had to basically remove um, that from our mix. We're, we're trying as much as possible to go with indicators that we know are going to be updated on a routine basis. Um, one of the indicators down toward the bottom is a water quality index, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit more in a, in a moment. Um, actually had, also had some Canadian involvement, and I'll, I'll discuss that in a moment. Next slide. Uh, and so in the 2010 report, if you want to go and download that, this table is available, and you can look through and see what kind of targets were set in, in these different cases. Um, I'm not really confident that if you're doing a local or provincial indicator effort that you know, internationally established targets are, are your best bet, uh, but that could be something we discuss in, uh, in our discussion se session. Uh, next slide. Uh, so moving along, uh, I mentioned the water quality index. This was an effort produced by a colleague at Yale who's, who's now moved on, but she was doing her PhD at Yale, uh, Tanya Srebotniak, uh, 
Um, uh, Genevieve Carr, who is at GEMS uh, Water Quality, um, so this is a UNEP water quality um, uh, repository. They collected data from around the world. Uh, Kerry Rickwood was also part of that, uh, GEMS Water Group, and um, they were actually based, um, I think, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, I may be mistaken. Uh, unfortunately, the Canadian government decided that they would no longer support GEMS Water, so now it's, uh, at least for the time being, it, it's defunct. It may be picked up by another donor, but we just don't know yet. Uh, but what, what we did for the Water Quality Index was basically look at um, uh, a number of standards that have been set by different countries, for, for instance, for total phosphorus and total nitrogen, um, and um, identified where appropriate standards had been set for those, for those particular pollutants. Um, next slide. So if you could move to the next slide, Crystal. Thanks. Um, so the, what we did then was we basically established targets for each parameter um, based on either those international standards uh, that relate to levels of eutrophication of water bodies or um, other kind of standards that GEMS Water felt were applicable. Um, you can see uh, where the sources come from in the fine print down below the table. This paper is available online, and if anyone on this webinar wants to receive a copy, just uh, send me an email. Uh, maybe uh, you know, Krista can send out my contact details um, after the webinar to anyone who participated. Uh, but you know, the idea was again to, for each parameter, measure uh, how close a country was doing against that target. And what we had to do was actually it was quite a statistical exercise. We had to compile all the station level data for, uh, for every country. We transformed every station's uh, values to this proximity, target, proximity to target score. And then we averaged the proximity to target scores across all the stations that reported for that country. And that was for all these parameters. So it was, it was um, a fairly substantial amount of uh, programming in R uh, by Tanya Surbatna. If you could go to the next slide. Um, for air pollution indices, the WHO is kind of the, the go-to place for air quality guidelines as far as human health is concerned, for obvious reasons. And so they've set certain parameters uh, for particulate matter, the fine particulate matter at 2.5 microns, uh, the, the, the coarser uh, particulate matter at 10 microns per cubic meter. Uh, and uh, you can see that the, the guidelines are Standards are lower, uh, they, or lower levels are required for the fine particulates because they're more harmful to human health uh, than they are for the, the coarser particulates. Ozone uh, concentrations, uh, nitrogen, di nitrogen di dioxide, and SO2 are also included in the WHO guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so China actually has a air pollution index, API, which they report on. Uh, for each city, and basically they've set the following targets for each of the parameters. Um, these parameters are actually reported in um, milligrams per cubic meter, so you have to uh, move the decimal places, uh, I think two places to the right, um, if I'm not mistaken, to, to get the proper um, micrograms per cubic meter. But um, you basically, um, uh, they, they measure each of these parameters separately, and then they come up with an API score for, uh, for, for a city based on, on these, uh, these measurements. As, as you know, uh, air quality has been a real issue in China of late, and uh, they're, they're making some strides on, on transparency, which is encouraging. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, EPA uh, produces an air quality index. In fact, the China EPI, API sorry, was modeled on the AQI. Uh, and interestingly, I, I looked on their website, the, the uh, EPA website, and I could not find, uh, but I didn't search extensively, but I could not find easily the, uh, the levels at which they set for each pollutant uh, to, to qualify for these. Um, kind of good to moderate to unhealthy to, uh, 
to very unhealthy um, uh, levels. Um, but they do have a little calculator, so if you want to go in into their calculator on the right, you can put in a um, value of uh, particulate matter, fine particulate matter of 30, and it'll tell you that it's moderate, so that means you don't need to be too concerned. People with respiratory or heart disease, uh, the elderly or children are most at risk. Um, this tool has basically been used as a communication tool as a way for people to know whether or not they can go outside if they have uh, asthma or other respiratory problems. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I have, I think, only two more examples. Uh, so if you're looking at your watch and wondering when, when in the world I'll end, um, these are the last two. Uh, the Well-Being of Nations was developed by Robert Prescott Allen, another Canadian, um, based in British Columbia. Uh, he, it's a one-off effort, but I thought it was admirable um, for, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that he not only sought to s establish uh, top and bottom kind of targets for low and high performance, but he sought to establish targets for everything in between. So he has uh, everything uh, targets for good, fair, medium, poor, bad, uh, and uh, I can't read the last one, base, base of scale. And then, you know, kind of uh, general definitions, desirable, objective fully met, acceptable, neutral, uh, undesirable, unacceptable. Um, and then for each country, basically, you can situate their overall score um, in this sort of red to green um, box on the right, where um, uh, the, the white part of the the score represents, he calls this thing an egg of sustainability. It's not a metaphor that's taken off in any great measure, but um, he liked the metaphor. The idea is that your human systems are on the inside, they're like the yolk, and your um, e ecological or environmental systems are the whites of the yolk, and, and if both are good, then the whole system is healthy, but if one is bad and the other is good, or, or vice versa, then then uh, something's wrong with the system. So this would be an example of uh, a country in which basically both the ecosystem well-being and the human well-being are poor. And then what you see is the components of the ecosystem well-being and the human well-being on those sort of um, the cross-like thing that goes up and down and, and left to right. Um, so each each of the components might be, you know, the only one this country does well at, I guess, is um, S. I'm not sure what that is, but um, that's on the ecosystem well-being score, and in one component of their ecosystem well-being, they're doing well. Next slide, please. And so I asked Robert, I said, well, Robert, how did you come up with these targets? Because um, I met him a few years ago after he published this, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you his answer in a moment, but basically this is an example of a fairly straightforward target setting effort where he had WHO uh, um, guidelines on what percent uh, of the population should be or could be with insufficient food and be considered good or acceptable. So it turns out that um, up to 10 percent of um, the the population, if they're without sufficient food, that's considered reasonably good. And then, you know, fair is from 10 to 20 percent, and, and uh, medium is from 20 to 35 percent, etc. And so he basically translates those, if you look to the right, uh, on the bottom you see the 10 percent, the 20 percent, the 35 percent, uh, and then on the, on the right-hand scale you'll see his 0 to 100 score um, and then he basically has the distribution of countries reporting values um, on the on the left hand side and that's how he he describes um, how many countries there are that are reporting so apparently a lot of the countries are doing very poorly um, with with red scores um, let's so I asked him I said well how did how did you set targets for some of the environmental parameters? Because you know there might at most be an international target for the best performance, but um, you know I'm pretty sure that there's no 
uh, international consensus around uh, these intermediate targets, and he said, well, he basically came up with them himself. So you can read his report. It's um, published by uh, Island Press, and um, I think it, it's very heroic in part because he, he, he had something like 100 or so metrics that he included in, in the overall well-being report. Next, next slide, and we'll, we'll wrap up with these. Uh, the last one uh, is an example is a recent effort by the World Resources Institute to produce um, something called the Aqueduct, uh, which is a water um, a portal for water data and water information. They essentially use the same kind of um, uh, thresholds. Um, you know, they 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 order the thresholds based on existing literature, governmental guidelines, range uh, and distribution of indicator values, and I think it's really hard in some cases to completely ignore what the statistical range is and, and uh, the, not only the range but also the, the, the mean and median and, and kind of the, the distribution overall um, between the worst and the best performance. Um, in some cases we find that almost every country is clustered right up against the, the target of, of the, the best performance target. So uh, it's, it's um, uh, sometimes we find it necessary to stretch things out a bit using log transformations and things like that. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, I think this next slide will just show how they go about setting, and it's similar to uh, Robert Prescott's Allen's approach where you have a raw value and then those raw values are somehow translated to uh, scores on a zero to five basis. Next, next slide. Um, and then, you know, they're actually doing everything on a gridded basis, so all of their data are gridded, and then you can uh, come up with an aggregate value for, for your grid cell. Next, next slide. Uh, so I'm going to conclude uh, with the following, and that is to say that targets are broadly, uh, broadly speaking, m more um, available in the uh, economic development arena with the MDGs. Uh, in the environmental arena, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, regarding what the proper thresholds would be. I think scientifically it's very hard to justify in some cases what the appropriate um, level is. Let's, you know, just let's use, uh, for instance, 350 parts per million uh, for CO2. Um, you know, some have said that that's a drop dead and, and really we need to get back to that 350 as, um, as a safe zone uh, or below. And others have said, well, you know, there's no real evidence to say that 350 is, is really a, a magical point at which um, things are going to change dramatically for the worse. And the same can be said of a biome protection or, or protected areas coverage. You know, should it be 10 percent, 17 percent? CBD just recently increased it to 17 percent, but that was largely a political decision, not, a, uh, not necessarily a scientific decision. Um, and then I was actually just at a meeting this last week uh, in Copenhagen talking with some water, water experts and uh, one of them I asked, well, where did this magical 40 percent of river flow should go for ecosystem services come from? And she responded that basically um, there was a lot of self-citation and nobody was really sure where it came from. Uh, and it's not really clear, you know, if that is an appropriate benchmark to set or not, and um, whether it represents it should be an average or whether it really should be throughout the year that 40 percent of your low flow as well as your peak flow should be reserved for nature is the right threshold. So I think there's substantial uncertainties in this area, and, and I'd be really eager to discuss what other people are thinking in this, in, this, in this area. So thank you very much for your time, and if you want to go to the last slide, I think I might have contact details. So if you want to email me, you can um, send me an email at that address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, I'll just let everyone know uh, if you would like to ask a question, you can do so uh, within the chat window. There is also a question window, or you can raise your hand. If you raise your hand, I can um, go ahead and provide uh, the microphone to you so you can actually speak directly. Uh, looks like we actually have a question first in the question window. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. Uh, and I'm going to actually ask Carla if she can read because my voice cuts out on <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, the question is, uh, it's from Anna. Uh, when you are tracking progress over time, is there a best practice for calculating whether a country is improving, staying constant, or worsening over time? 
and th this multi-part question. Uh, do you look at if they've improved from the year before, or look at if they've improved over a longer time scale to reduce the impact of anomalies? Do they need to pass a certain threshold, for example, greater than 5% improvement, to go from staying constant to improving? Well, there's a lot in that question. Um, and it's a really good one. Uh, so I didn't. I did in one of my earlier slides sort of mention that, um, or at least had in the text that there tend to be, you know, kind of two types of indicators. One is um, a, a present day what's going on versus a trend indicator, which shows you know how things have changed. Um, and um, we've experimented with some of the trend indicators. We have a little less less experience in that area. Um, you know, one approach is to run a trend line through the whole time series. Um, and if the trend line is positive, um, you know, it's going up, and the parameter that you're desiring is is on the on the high end, then then that would be a positive trend, and you would reward a country accordingly. And you could actually just essentially transform the trend lines, um, you know, do a, do a statistical transformation to get your score from the trend line. Uh, another would be to set some, some threshold to say, well, if you increase by 5% or more, um, you get a gold star, and if you, um, you know, uh, only approve by a certain lower percent, then you don't get such a good score, and if you essentially are declining, then you, um, you get effectively a zero. Um, we've also had um, data that come in um, uh, roster formats uh, where we've, uh, this is a case where we looked at trends in coastal water quality using satellite data. And um, what we did in that case was we ran a trend line through the entire 10-year um, time series of, uh, in this case, chlorophyll concentrations. and um, the, uh, what we had to do, though, was um, in the statistical processing, uh, insert a monthly dummy because um, chlorophyll concentrations vary so much between seasons. What you want to do is essentially get a trend that's um, independent of the the month month on month variation. So um, there's I don't you know none of this is uh, codified in some master um, you know guidebook for sustainability indicators I'm sure the OECD is also um, weighed in on this though so it might be worth looking at the OECD uh, indicators um, guideline documents to see if they've actually suggested approaches for doing that okay and I hope that answers your question uh, if not just let us know we can, uh, we can add Oh, she's responded back the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I do have one question for you, too. Um, with respect to the targets that you were discussing and the ones that note expert opinion, um, for a lot of the folks who are from community or provincial governments, I think this question might come up, is how do you derive those expert opinions and what constitutes an expert to you? <laughs> well, that's thinly veiled. Um, you know, a thinly veiled um, term that basically means we came up with a number ourselves based on, I mean, we do hold workshops and we work with experts and so we, we try to bring in as many people as we can, but obviously, you know, um, you don't always necessarily have access to the top um, top expert in, in any subject domain at any given time, so you're often left to make your best approximation with the brain trust you have at your disposal. And so we do some of this in our expert workshops, uh, and then we do some of it just in the very end of the, the processing phase where we're, we're really looking at the statistical di distributions and trying to come up with something that, that makes sense and doesn't, you know, we, we try, it's not always successful, we try to set targets that are realistic enough that if there isn't really any established norm, at least um, countries wouldn't just throw up their hands and say that's a completely unrealistic target that, you know, let's say setting uh, CO2 emissions at zero. Um, you know, statistically, um, 
it might not have a very big impact on the ultimate scores uh, and rankings of countries because whether you set the target at zero or 1,200 tons per person, um, it's the countries are going to fall in that range uh, in the in the range whatever range they're in uh, in the relative order in ranking, no matter what the target is. So in some ways, the the target may be immaterial, but I think there is a political element in which the target needs to represent. Uh, an aspirational value that people could say, yeah, we could reach that with some effort, we could get there. But zero CO2, I think, you know, maybe for Denmark, I was just there, and they're apparently trying to be uh, completely off the grid, I should say completely uh, independent of fossil fuels by um, 2020 or something like that. So they set extremely ambitious targets. But for the rest of the world, I think they would kind of, uh, you know, shrug their shoulders and say, we can't do it. Fair enough. Okay, I, I see we have a question from Steve uh, Ballmer. Uh, I will turn your phone on here, Steve. You should be able to talk right about now. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay, um, I typed the question in, and I'll read it quickly, but we actually have to get out of our conference. So, um, I may not even hear the answer. Um, but thanks for the presentation. Uh, what, two things. We're looking at a smaller scale than what you presented on, so at a watershed level, you know, in a local community trying to look at the, the, the relationship between ecosystem services um, and how they impact human health and, and community health and, and well-being. And so I, I was interested in maybe a perspective on that. And then um, also uh, uh, we often look at it in a reverse way. So rather than looking at in environmental um, indices uh, that then relate to human health, um, what we were looking at uh, doing for one community here in, in British Columbia was to consider the, uh, the human health as the target, so saying we want to improve some aspect of human health or human well-being, and then how do we define that through using environmental indices that we can measure on, on, on the land base, and, and perhaps activities to try and improve some of the ecosystem services that are being protected and provided in a watershed. Yeah, I mean, I think these things really come down to who is your audience and what are you trying to obtain. And if that's, you know, if you had stakeholders involved, Steve, that said human health is really our overarching objective and then let's see how we can get, you know, a lot of the new efforts are really focused around, you know, there's this global happiness index. Um, there's a lot of metrics now that are saying, look at, we're, um, you know, we need to focus more on, on human satisfaction, but in ways that are perhaps independent of just consuming more stuff. And um, so, yeah, I mean, certainly setting goals for your environmental parameters that are consistent with certain human health parameters um, would make a lot of sense. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm just cognizant of the time now, too. I know a lot of other folks are going to have to, to, to leave us as well. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much, Alex. This was a, a great presentation. I will definitely uh, take you up on the offer for you to send along those PDFs and that journal article um, because I'll be able to distribute those to the members who I'm sure uh, most folks would, would want to have a look at. Uh, so, yes, once again, thanks very much, Alex. I know you just got off the plane yesterday and had to throw all this together, but we really appreciate it. We haven't talked targets in a long time, and it was a, a good reference for, for folks who have been a part of this, and it was also a good information piece for folks who are trying to struggle to figure out what exactly targets are and how they can do them. Well, I do hope it was useful, and I, I enjoyed um, uh, meeting with all of you virtually. Thank you very much. Um, everyone, uh, thanks very much, and have a wonderful day. And Alex will be in touch. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.